Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Southern Four Wheel Drive TechNet Season 2, Episode 4. We're going to talk about your vehicle. Actually, Mike's going to do most of the talking. Me and you are going to be listening. Uh, he's going to he's going to teach us about some of the components of our vehicle, both outside and inside, and help us understand why it's, these components are. It's going to be important for us to understand what these components are and how they work when we get, when we go off roading. Uh, Mike, what's our grand prize, Mike? Our grand prize is. Five, not one, not two, not three, not four, but five BFG tires. Your choice up to 37 inches in size, KO2s or KM3s. So you can enter for a chance to win those tires in every episode that you watch and comment during the live stream with what Al tells you to comment. We'll enter you for a chance to win those tires. So make sure, again, go to BFG's Facebook page, send them a message. Say hey, thank you guys for supporting Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. We've got we've got thirty nine people watching us right now. So let's not let's not waste any more time with me babbling, Mike. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You're gonna go full screen and uh, tell us what we need to know about our vehicle. Sounds great. All right, guys. Yeah, just like Al said, remember to preface your question with a cue so that we know it's a question, and we will do our best to answer them at the end of the live stream. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. This is going to be a two-part series. Um, so this portion, this first one, we're going to focus on the outside of the vehicle. Then the next one, we'll be focused on the inside of the vehicle and kind of learning the ins and outs about seat placement and stuff like that. So without dragging anything out, let's go ahead and get started. So things we should know about our vehicle when we're thinking about the outside. Well, let's start with some terminology, right, that's on the market. I'm going to grab my demo here my little RC truck that I've got here, but some of the terminology that um, and things you need to be, know about your vehicle when you're on the trail. First off is you'll hear a lot of people talk about approach angle, obviously big tired little vehicle here, but approach angle is the angle at which you can approach an obstacle and get your tires on it before something on the front of your vehicle hits, whatever the lowest hanging point is, which sometimes is factory tow hooks on Toyotas, uh, Jeeps, it could be um, lots of different things, depending on the year of the Jeep. The next thing we want to know is the breakover angle. And that is the center line point of your vehicle right here. And from the center of the rear tire to the center of the front, the angle at which we can cross over an obstacle and not get high centered or turtled on an obstacle. The last thing uh, we want to know is departure angle. Okay, departure angle is from the center line of the rear tire here to the lowest hanging point in the rear, which is normally our trailer hitch. And that is the angle at which we can depart off an obstacle without catching the rear of our vehicle. Typically, things like pickup trucks, um, like your Jeep Gladiator, Toyota Tacoma, have much worse departure angles than things like your four-door Jeeps, um, Toyota 4Runners, things like that, because they have a lot more overhang in the rear. Things like Jeeps, um, your Jeep Wranglers have really great approach angle because they open up the wheel on the front. Uh, and normally they have sort of a, a stubby bumper on the front that opens up your approach angle very well. Whereas Toyotas typically have a lot of flashing over the front. So we can we can change the approach angle with bumpers, bigger tires, or a lift. Same thing with the breakover. We can normally change that with a bigger tire or a suspension lift. And in the rear, we can do things like different bumpers in the rear, bigger tire, or lift kits. But understanding when you purchase your vehicle or when you make modif modifications to the, your vehicle, understanding these angles is super important. So they are very important because, they, first off, they all work together, right? Approach angle, breakover, and departure angle. Approach angle, if we have don't have good approach angle or we don't understand what it is, we can drive the front end of our vehicle into a ditch when we're trying to cross or ram it onto a rock when we're trying to climb a rock. If we don't know um, our breakover angle, we could get high centered when we're crossing over rocks or a hill climb cresting the top. And then departure angle, we could get caught coming off of obstacles. So super important to understand and that all these work together because with approach angle, we may have great approach angle and breakover angle, but if we have terrible departure angle, we can get our front tires on 
We can get over, but we can't get off the obstacle. Same thing. We may have bad approach angle, but great breakover and great departure. So we can't even get our front tires on the obstacle. So understanding that all these work together when we're navigating obstacles on the trail is super important. All Thank right. You. Yep. Next thing I want to talk about is right here on vehicles, if I can get close enough, is the pillars of the vehicle or the structure of the vehicle. Some people call it a ROP system, rollover protection system. Your windshield pillar right here is always called your A pillar. Okay. The next one that's typically right by, by the driver's head is your B pillar. And then so forth on down alphabetically, C pillar, D pillar, if you have an SUV. So these pillars are important for a couple of reasons. One, understanding the structural integrity of the roof of your vehicle in the event of a rollover and you have to recover the vehicle. The B pillar is always the most structural piece of any vehicle. But identifying where these pillars are, the B pillar is also where the pivot point of our vehicle is. And what I mean by that is when we're in four-wheel drive and we're driving down the trail, if we are going around an obstacle like a tree, we don't want to start turning until it's past that B pillar. Because if we start turning too early, we're actually going to turn the vehicle into the obstacle. So keeping that pivot point of that B pillar in mind, identifying that on our vehicle is super important. And depending on the length of the vehicle, it could be a little behind the B pillar, but typically that's a good starting point. All right. Now, knowing and understanding your vehicle, let's go underneath of it. OK, this is super important. There's some major things that you need to understand about your vehicle when you purchase it. First off, the most important is what type of four wheel drive system does it have? Is it a part time four wheel drive system? Is it a full time four wheel drive system? But if you want to identify what your vehicle has as far as a four wheel drive system, a lot of times just looking at the shift knob on your vehicle will let you know if you have a two high, says a two and then an H and an I, then a four high and a four low. Most likely you have a part-time four-wheel drive system. This means you cannot run your four-wheel drive on hard ball surfaces like concrete and asphalt. But if you have on your shift knob a four high and then a four low, then you have a full-time four-wheel drive system. Now, sometimes you will see vehicles that have funky shifters like Toyota or Land Rovers, right? And they will say four high, four low, then four high lock and four low lock. The reason this is, is because full time four wheel drive systems have a center differential. OK, a center differential that allows slippage front to rear. OK, so that we can drive them on pavement. But when we get off road, that center differential can let the power slip to the front or rear of the truck and can cause a lot of problems off road. So we have to be able to lock that four-wheel drive system in so that now it is just like a part-time four-wheel drive system. But that means with a full-time four-wheel drive system, when you lock that center differential, you cannot run it on the road, not on asphalt, concrete, hardball surfaces, okay? Now, like your Grand Cherokees, I believe there's even some Toyota 4Runners for a little while that had a part-time and a full-time four-wheel drive system that you could run, and they had a too high then they had a four high that you could run on the road and then a four low that you could not run on the road. Um, understanding that type of four wheel drive system is super important so you don't do damage to your vehicle because if you run it in true four wheel drive on the road, it will do serious harm to your vehicle. All right, so the other thing about understanding your four wheel drive system, which we'll get into a little bit more next week is a shifting procedure and how you should use those uh, four high and four low when you're off road. Um, but again, we're gonna get in that because that's more of an inside the vehicle thing next week. All right, so let's talk about some more components underneath the vehicle, okay? This is where all of the different things underneath our vehicle are. We've got differentials, we've got cross members, drive shafts, steering linkage, our axles, all sorts of stuff underneath the vehicle. And I'm gonna break out my other model right here that highlights that a little bit more, okay? So with this, 
some of the things we want to know is where these low hanging points are. That's some of the first things we want to identify. Normally on most vehicles, okay, two things are your lowest hanging points. One, these differentials here, okay? And we've talked about differentials before, so I'm not going to go super in depth in that. But their job is to differentiate power left to right, okay? So they can allow slippage left to right. Now, not like your center differential that does front to back. Similar how it works, but it does it side to side. But our differentials typically are a low hanging point. They are also a vulnerable point underneath our vehicle. If we smash this differential on rocks or do damage to this housing on the rocks, and I've even seen where we slam this housing down on a rock and actually uh, dent it in and break it, and then our fluid leaks out, now our differential is going to burn up because it's going to be too hot, right? It's not going to have any fluid to lubricate it. So knowing where these are, th this low hanging point underneath our vehicle is super important. You can see here, we, we're going to have one in the rear and one in the front. Normally, most vehicles, the one in the front is going to be offset to either the driver's side or passenger side of the truck. The center one or the rear one is going to be in the center. So it's going to be a little bit easier to see. But we want to identify where those are so we can pass rocks to the side. With, with uh, understanding where these differentials are and protecting them, super important. You can put armor on them to protect the housings um, and things like that. All right. Now, get a little bit more in depth on things you should understand about your vehicle. And I'm not going to go super because we can get way off in the weeds. But in these differentials, you have a gear set, right? You sometimes they're you know whatever four ten gears four fifty five gears even lower or higher numerically. This makes a difference in how your vehicle crawls in four wheel drive low range. Super important, super important because when we change these tire sizes right here and go to a bigger tire, it changes the crawl ratio of our vehicle, what we call the final crawl ratio of our vehicle. So when we change that with bigger tires, we do need to re-gear these differentials to keep that slow crawl speed. That's why the Rubicons are so awesome because they have, uh, first off, really high numerically, okay, but low crawl ratio gears in the differentials and in the transfer case, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But that helps them crawl really slow, creepy, crawly off-road. All right. Other low hanging points, the other major ones that you'll see a lot of times are shock hangers, right? Now, I don't have shock hangers on this one that you can really see, but like on the Jeeps, on JKs and JLs, normally they're right here, just on the inside of the tires, right? And they typically hang down just as far or further than the differential. And they're normally out of just stamped steel and welded onto the axle. So if we bash these really hard against rocks, they can catch us and then kind of impede or halt our forward movement. And you'll see a picture Al's going to throw up here that shows his ground clearance that he has at his shock hanger. You can see it hanging down real low, right? But if we hit too hard on these shock hangers, we can damage them, okay? We can bend them, causing the shock to be in a bind and cause issues with that shock being able to come press and rebound back out. We can also break one um, if we hit it hard enough, enough times. That's why, very important, if we're going to have to, if we've got a tall rock or a log or something that we want to cross or we really want to get that tire on that obstacle. Because when we do, okay, it lifts all that stuff up and out of the way, lifts it all up and out of the way um, so that we don't get hung up on those rocks. So remember, Knowing your vehicle where those low hanging points are, the differentials, as well as those shock hangers down in the front. Other things that you have that are low hanging in the front that are vulnerable and can cause a bad day on the trail. Understanding where your steering linkage is on the trail. Now you can see here on my RC as I rotate this and the steering linkage moves back and forth, you've got a tie rod here. That tie rod ties these two tires together, okay? So that when they one tire turns, both tires turn. This also controls your alignment on the front end, your toe in and toe out. Okay, toe in, 
where those tires tow in too much or tow out where they actually turn out too much. If we hit this on rocks, because I believe on Jeeps, it's right in front, Toyotas, it's in behind the axle. But right here in the front, if we hit this too hard, we can bend it and that affects our toe in and toe out and can cause really bad tire wear or can do it so bad like this, right, that we may not be able to drive the vehicle home. Now, after that tie rod there, you've got what they call a drag link. And it's really hard to see on this one right here, but we can see this drag link right here. Sometimes it connects to the tie rod. Sometimes it goes all the way over and connects to the inside of the tire right here. That drag link is connected to our steering box on solid axles with a pitman arm, okay? And this is just for solid axles now. But that, that drag link is what the steering box will push and pull one tire, okay, and turn it left and right. But that tie rod is what ties both tires together. As we lift and change our vehicles, we need to make sure, okay, that all of this geometry stays as close as we can to flat and stock. That really affects our steering and how well our steering works. But know where these are on your vehicle, okay? And these are maintenance points because they do have uh, tie rod ends on the end of them that can wear out and need to be replaced. Or they might be greasable if you're lucky, right? They might be greasable and you need to shoot some grease in them every once in a while if they are a serviceable part. With independent front suspension, okay? It's a little bit different as far as what we have kind of on the front end here. We don't have a tie rod and a drag link on the front end. We do have kind of uh, a tie rod end that's super important to know about, but because we have all this area right here and only one tire moves up and down, excuse me, there's no low hanging tie rod and drag link on this independent front suspension that we have to worry about. And if you guys are a little confused as to independent front suspension versus solid axle, go back and look at some of our older videos, especially one with Clemson Four Wheel Drive Center, where we talked about suspension systems. And that will help you on our YouTube channel. That will help you kind of understand the difference between IFS and solid axle. All right. Now, let's talk about transfer cases and transmissions okay transfer case okay just like the name implies it transfers power to the front of the vehicle and the rear of the vehicle that's one of its primary goals the other primary focus of the transfer case is gear reduction to get that awesome final crawl ratio okay Transfer cases are what you're shifting when you shift it from too high to four high to four low. Too high, run any speed on the road you want to, or if it's a full-time four-wheel drive vehicle, and, full, and four high as well. Four high, okay, when you shift your transfer case into four high, it keeps the exact same gear ratio that two high has. So you can run it, for the most part, okay, within reason, as fast as two high. but when we shift this transfer case in our vehicle into four low, four wheel drive low range, okay, that gives us a huge benefit of gear reduction. Depending on the vehicle, again, kind of using the Rubicon as, as an example, they have that rock track four to one transfer case, which gives it that awesome low crawl ratio. But a lot of vehicles, um, your standard vehicles out there, it's about 2.5 to one or two to one, somewhere in that range. Some of them are a little more. Some of them out there may even be a little less, right? But that's why when we're at really slow speeds off-road, we want to shift that transfer case into four low if we're on technical terrain. Now, understanding why we're focusing on that outside of the vehicle is because our transfer case a lot of times underneath the vehicle is vulnerable and it's at the center point. Remember we talked about breakover. Okay, it's in the center point right here with a cross member. From the factory, their skid plates are just little sheet metal steel. So it's important to understand where that transfer case is so that we can protect it at all costs. Now, connected to the transfer case is the transmission. Okay, now I'm not going to talk too much about this, but connected to that 
tra uh, transfer case, the transmission is what gives us our gear, right? First gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear, so on, depending on the vehicle. Older vehicles may have less gears. Newer ones may have, even have eight or 10 speed transmissions. But regardless of what type of transmission, whether it's an automatic or a manual transmission, when you're off road, you're going to drive it like a manual transmission. I don't mean pushing the clutch in to shift gears and things like that, but we are never with an automatic transmission just going to choose drive. Okay. We always want to control when the vehicle shifts and whether or not it stays in a gear. So we're going to shift it over to sport shift mode, which is what a lot of vehicles call it, or manual shift mode. And we're going to control it shifting one, two, three, four through the transmission. But remember on your transmission that you have a transmission pan that houses your transmission fluid and it can be vulnerable. Um, the other thing also is the transmission gets very hot. So the reason I'm kind of going over this outside the vehicle is it's a vulnerable point if you're not careful, but it can also it can also hold a lot of heat. And if you get a lot of dry grass trapped in close around it when you're driving through a field it can start a fire, right? Or if for whatever reason you overheat the vehicle or overheat the transmission, sorry, um, because you're using four high when you should be using four low, it can puke that transmission fluid out and start a fire. So make sure, right, that you're using the correct four high versus four low um, when you're on the trails. And again, you can go back and learn about a lot of that, when to choose which, um, on our YouTube series for these tech nets. All right, so that's a lot about underneath the vehicle. Now, there's other things we want to understand. Um, we're not going to go super in depth with that tonight, but sway bars, if you have disconnectable sway bars, okay, especially on solid axle vehicles, they're going to have sway bar disconnects. Where and how to disconnect those? Is it a button inside the vehicle? We'll talk about that next episode. Or is it manual disconnects outside the vehicle that you have to do? Knowing what tools you're going to need to that to do that. I'll start up a diagram for us right here. But on here, I want you to take a look at kind of what's numbered and what's labeled. Number one, right there, the stabilizer links. Okay, that's what attaches our sway bar down to the frame. Now, what does a sway bar do? The sway bar controls the body roll left to right when we're on the road, but it limits our flex off road, drastically limits our flex. OK, so we want to understand that we want sway bars on the road. I know you old school guys right now with CJs and stuff like that. Ah, you know, nobody needs sway bars. And even some of you hardcore JK rock crawlers, ah, nobody needs sway bars. Well. If we're driving long distances, sway bars make it a whole lot more comfortable and safe at high speed. Um, the next thing he's got labeled there, number two, is the shock absorber. Remember, we talked about the low hanging points with the shock absorbers where they're tied down at the bottom of the frame. Number three, the upper suspension arm on solid axles, upper control arms, right, and lower control arms. The stabilizer bar, number four, okay, that's that sway bar. And then Coil spring, whether or not it's a coil sprung vehicle or a leaf sprung vehicle, right? Some of us pickup truck guys have leaf springs in the rear, not coil springs. Some of the old school guys have leaf springs front and rear of the vehicle. Number six, bump stops, right? This is super important to understand if you're making modifications to your vehicle, right? You may need to change the length of your bump stops, or if you're doing a lot of really hard rock crawling, um, if you're really beating your vehicle up, as long as you're being tread lightly, right? But you may have to change over to a more high performance bump stop um, that can help out. Number seven, the lower suspension arm. You can see here on this one, these lower suspension arms um, that a lot of times um, kind of highlight your breakover angle for you. Track bars. Track bars are on solid axle vehicles, front and rear. The track bar, okay, number eight there, stay, stays, is what keeps our axle centered left to right, okay, so that this axle doesn't just slide underneath the vehicle side to side. Track bars, a lot of times, is where that dreaded death wobble comes from. <gasps> death wobble, right? 
Yes. A lot of times it comes from our track bar because as we off-road a lot, those joints on that track bar get stretched and then back into place, stretched and back into place, or the geometry is off because we've lifted and modified our vehicle. So we need to get an adjustable track bar. Also pay close attention where the track bar mounts to the frame because you may need to change the mounting location or reinforce the mounting location where the track bar goes to. Number nine, the axle and differential like we talked about. Number 10, the steering stabilizer. All right, steering stabilizers. These are awesome and there's some new products on the market that make them even cooler for when we have big tires so we have more control on the road and a little bit softer steering off-road. They're actually adjustable, like a set of um, uh, shocks that are adjustable, right? Like your ARB BP51s that have adjustable rebound and compression. You can get steering stabilizers that are adjustable. But a lot of times when people have death wobble, they say you need a new steering stabilizer. All a steering stabilizer does is hide a problem that's already there. It's there to dampen your steering. So if you have death wobble, it's just going to dampen that death wobble and you're not going to feel it as much. Okay. You don't want to expect a steering stabilizer to fix the death wobble problem, but it will dampen your steering and make it a little nicer steering on and off road. Drag link, we talked about, tie rod ends, we talked about, and the cross member, number 13, that's the cross member typically that's underneath of our transfer case that's holding our transfer case up. Again, the skid play for that normally is pretty cheap or chintzy from the factory. Some vehicles have upgraded ones, but being aware of where that is and making sure you're not hitting that cross member because a lot of times that's where we're getting hung up in our breakover angle. All right. So, a few other things that we should know about the outside of our vehicle, okay? First and foremost, whatever vehicle that you purchase, okay? and you are running off road with, we need to know where the, if it's non-modified, we need to know where the factory approved, okay, this is key, factory approved recovery points are. There are differences, okay, every loop and hook on our vehicle is not a factory approved recovery point. Most manufacturers will not notate them as recovery points, but they will be designated as tow points and tie down points okay we don't ever want to use tie down points for recovery because that's all they are is to be able to tie that vehicle down during freight when it's on a trailer or it's being shipped somewhere the tow points are ideal for recovery for static recoveries right not kinetic recoveries and if you're confused about which is which go back and check our past youtube videos but they are for static recoveries. Jeeps do have really nice recovery points that hold up in kinetic recoveries from the factory. Yes, Al. I don't have, I don't have to worry about that. I'll just use the ball on my toe, toe hitch. <laughs> yeah. well, oh, I knew you would say that. No, that is not an approved recovery point. That ball is designed just for towing trailers. Um, it does not have the sheer strength to hold up to recovery and will break. Um, but you can use your hitch in the rear if you have an approved, a rated uh, hitch link that will slide in there and a good hitch pin that you and you can make a connection to that hitch link or receiver recovery point um, on the rear of your vehicle. Jeep's recovery points on the front are really nice because they're kind of straight up and down with a little hook on them and we can attach to those. Now, if we've modified a vehicle or if you run into a modified vehicle on the trail and they need recovery, okay, kind of snow season. So we see a lot of that here in the mountains. But when we're identifying modified recovery points, it gets a little bit more important to check how those modified recovery points are attached. If you run up on an aftermarket bumper, how is that aftermarket bumper tied to the vehicle? Is it homemade from mikesbasement.com, right? Well, you may not want to use it, okay? How is it tied into the frame? Is it good grade A hardware or good rated hardware? And are your recovery points on them good rated recovery points that are in line with the frame rail, right? Not offset up or down or side to side further out. 
We really want them in line with the frame rail. That's why our hitch in the rear of the vehicle is so good because it's tied directly to the frame and it's centered between both frame rails. So it splits the load between both. But understanding where those recovery points are and that they're ideal recovery points to be used is super important. The other thing, right, that we want you to know about your vehicle um, pertaining to kind of recovery is where are the lifting points from your vehicle? If you're lifting with a high lift jack, do you have frame mounted sliders that you can lift from? Okay. Some of your sliders on Jeeps and stuff are not necessarily frame mounted. Okay. They might be mounted to the pinch weld. Um, some of your Nerf bars and side steps on Toyotas, nope, can't lift from those. They need to be frame mounted. Even your factory Rubicon sl sliders are not sufficient to be able to lift from the side with a high lift. Knowing where to lift in the front from a recovery point with a high lift jack if you need to, not somewhere plastic, not on one of these tubes on the front, right? Also, knowing where to lift with your bottle jack underneath your vehicle. That's going to be outlined in your user manual, owner's manual of your vehicle. You're like, owner's manual, what's that? It's in the glove box of your vehicle, hopefully. If not, you can find it online. But it will tell you where you should lift from on your axle with your bottle jack to change a tire and stuff like that. But that is super, super important to know. Right. Because we do run into tire problems, especially those of us that aren't running BFGs. Right. Let's be real. BFGs, best tires out there. All right. So these are some things that we want to know about the outside of our vehicle. Right. And um, it's not, again, not an exhaustive everything you need to know, but we're trying to condense it down as much as we can. We're going to go through some questions here, but I happen to see a comment. It says, not the ball, use the holes for the safety chains. And then some smiley faces with laughs. Yeah, yeah. Well, we don't really want to use that. Just, I, I know you're joking, but um, other people out there listening, let's make sure we're not doing that. All right, Al, what is some questions um, about uh, today's lecture? Okay, well, Randy Land, we all know. Uh, hey, Randy. Had a, had a couple of comments and a question. Why is the front differential offset to one side and the rear is so right in the center? The front, the front differential is offset on vehicles, and it's hard for me to kind of show here. But typically it's offset because of the orientation of where the drive shafts come out of the transfer case. Most transfer cases... Um, they'll have a rear output in the center of the vehicle, but the front output will be left or right on the side of the vehicle. So that's why differentials are typically offset one side or the other, because I'm a geek and I nerd out on this stuff. With your differential being offset on the left or right, you have a long axle shaft and a short axle shaft. And a lot of people will think that a lot of times the short axle shaft is stronger than the long one, which is incorrect to a certain extent you're more likely to break that short axle shaft because it has less twist than the long axle shaft. So a lot of times if you break one side or the other, it's because that uh, axle shaft is shorter with less twist. Okay, so let's, uh, Mr. Blake Myers had a question and it says, he wants to know what the Toyota flop angle is. What's the Toyota flop angle? I, I'm thinking he means rolling over. Uh, it and varies by vehicle. So um, the the rollover on the vehicle, for most vehicles really, is typically over 45 degrees. Um, but this is static, so it's kind of hard to judge that. Um, and it's different between the um, Toyota Tacoma versus the Toyota 4Runner. Uh, in years, it's different. But a lot of times, it's over 45 degrees. So it's quite a bit um, on Toyotas and Jeeps. It's quite a bit as well. Um, but we they always measure these in static scenarios. Okay, we're doing pretty good on time. So let me let me try to stump you on that topic a little bit more. Uh, okay, so I I've, I've got my Toyota sitting there, and it just came off the factory floor, and it has an X degree of flop angle. Boom! Now I've lifted it three and a half inches. What did that do to my flop angle? It does. It, it does make it worse because now the vehicle is taller, so it's got a higher center of gravity. 
right? And with vehicles, you have what they call um, sprung weight and unsprung weight. So anything above your axles is um, sprung weight, right? So it's bouncy. And when we put a lift kit on there, especially if it's a really flexy lift kit, kind of makes the vehicle want to lean more when it's mm -hmm. off camber. Um, also, by changing our sway bar, if we take the sway bar off, it can also change the flop angle, too. Okay, well, on my JK, I've got a two and a half inch lift. So to keep it from affecting my flop angle, I put different wheels on with outside edges of my tires are three inches further out than they are stock. Do you think yes. that compensates for the additional lift to sort of keep that flop angle about the same? Yes and no. Um, okay. It does help because it widens your stance. And again, so that's that's what we call unsprung weight. So it helps stabilize you. Um, but it depends on the lift kit because if you have a really flexy lift kit and you're off camber, then that vehicle can lean more and more. It does help, but to the extent at which it helps depends on the type of vehicle and uh, the type of lift kit that you have on there. Okay. Well, Randy Lynn is full of questions tonight. Uh, she wants to know inclinometer. So okay. those are um, in the clinometers, inclinometers. Typically, those are inside the vehicles, and it tells you the degree or the pitch and angle which you're front to back and side to side. Um, some Toyotas, even I think Jeeps for a little while, came with little analog factory ones in there. Um, a lot of us have apps on our phones and stuff like that um, that have those on it. They're cool, right? And they're they're helpful um, to a certain extent. But the last thing that we really want people doing is paying attention to that. When when I teach about rollover points of vehicles, it's more of a feeling of the seat in the pants because uh, like a, a, a clinometer will tell you static, right? How far you're over. But if your static rollover is, let's say, 48 degrees, but you're traveling now and you're bouncing along down the trail lane sideways, if you bounce up over a rock or, you know, one tire dips down in, you may still be at 48 degrees, but, or you may even be at 45 degrees, which is a little less and still roll the vehicle because it's more dependent upon speed, terrain type, and how you're you're driving that vehicle. You know, they're cool. Just don't focus on them. They are helpful um, in certain cases, but again, don't focus on them. Focus more on that seat of the pants feeling. Um, and if you feel that you're about to roll over, turn downhill if you can and accelerate, and centrifugal force will force those uphill tires back down um so that you can drive out of that rollover but don't drive off the cliff is it best to have a roll bar inside um cage or support to a jeep is it best to have a roll bar best inside at that point um typically with and i'm guessing deborah because you have an xj um you know you're talking about putting an interior cage in a vehicle Yes, uh, those do help with those style of vehicles and rollovers. Um, it is good to have an interior one, um, but whether it's interior or exterior is kind of hit or miss. Um, an exo cage versus an interior roll cage or roll bar, um, either one is going to be better. Uh, that's why Jeep Wranglers, you know, they run their roll bar system or their rollover protective system. Exo cages do tend to protect, protect the vehicle more in a rollover than an interior cage. But a lot of times, if you're at that point of putting one of those on, then you probably don't care too much about the vehicle. It's more of a trail rig anyway. Um, but, you know, that being said, if you're doing some hardcore rock crawling, even on JKs and stuff like that, it is good to reinforce that roll bar with, in some way, shape, or form. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. So Chuck Robar has a question. Um, how do spacers affect alignment or wear on the front end? Um, spacers on the suspension uh, or on the like wheel spacers. So if Let's we're talking about um, spacers on the front end, typically on uh, Jeeps, right? Um, and solid axle style vehicles, spacers 
in the suspension aspect don't really affect um, a lot of the alignment or wear because when we lift this vehicle, okay, with a solid axle, we're just dropping those tires down, right? Just straight up and down. So it doesn't make a huge difference as far as um, toe in and toe out. What it does change is our caster, which is front to back, right, of the rotation of the v of the tire and how it turns. So it does affect that as far as our steering on the road. Independent front suspension vehicles with spacers on the front, they do affect our alignment, right? Because they don't necessarily lift this front end in the correct geometry needed um, in order to uh, keep everything aligned correctly. That's why a lot of times, you know, your spacers and stuff in the suspension are going to be very small as far as how much you can lift the vehicle so that they can still get it within spec versus a full suspension kit that really works to keep everything in line with the geometry. Now, if it's a wheel spacer, not so much, um, it really doesn't affect much as far as our alignment or wear and tear on the front end. It does affect our wear and tear a little bit because we're widening the front end, um, but it's very minimal on our vehicles for the most part. Um, the big key with those wheel spacers to widen the stance of the vehicle is to make sure that they stay torqued correctly um, with the correct torque setting and done periodically, right? Not something that you're just going to kind of torque them down and forget about. And if you need to know about torque settings, go back and watch our uh, tools video with SunX Tools um, at Clemson Four Wheel Drive Center. They talk all about torque wrenches. It was pretty cool. Okay, so Paul has a question. Um, we're going to help me interpret it here. Should they ball off when off road? when possible i think he topped that when we were talking about when i made the joke about the towing from the ball so talk a little bit more about that that hitch that we got back there I yeah i typically recommend pulling uh and taking hitches out all together um when you're off road because number one you know it does decrease your departure angle because now you have more overhang out the back number two you get that truck buried in mud or in a less than ideal situation, the last thing you want to be doing is fighting with that hitch pin to get that out to put in a recovery point like a hitch link from Factor 55, um, you know, a receiver hitch mounted recovery point in the rear to get yourself out. So typically I'll recommend taking the hitches out and go ahead and put your recovery point in there ahead of time. Um, that way you don't forget about it and end up in the mud. Ask me how I know. <laughs> um, you know, thank thank everyone for tuning in and watching this. Um, and again, supporting Southern Four Wheel Drive. Like I say with every show, guys, make sure that you really do like and share. Tell everybody about these TechNet videos. This is helping Southern again, not just you know put out good information and fulfill the one portion of our mission statement of education, but it also creates awareness for Southern Four Wheel Drive. This is huge, guys. This is really big that we create this awareness for, for Southern Four Wheel Drive Association um, because it is a nonprofit organization. Uh, and it's super important that we keep the member base up because this is the group that helps us in the Southeast with land use. Okay. So we want to continue to support that. So make sure you like, share, tell your mom, dad, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters. I don't care. Even if they don't have a four wheel drive, tell, tell your, Tell your dog's hairdresser. Well, hey, Randy, Lynn, Randy, wait, 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 Randy Lynn. Some, boy, she's she's just full of questions tonight. Um, let me, we're doing okay with time. So she says, and let me read, kind of off topic, but you mentioned torque on the spacers. I'm pretty sure she means wheel spacers there. If you use blue Loctite during the install, yeah, so um, breaking the Loctite down uh, when you break those off. Yes, you do. Um, if you're using Loctite when you put the spacer on, which some manufacturers recommend using Loctite, some don't. Um, I would not rely 100% on the Loctite, but if you have it on in there and it's recommended, then I would take them off, re-Loctite them, and put them back on again with the correct torque. Um, the la I would rely, again, with lug nuts and stuff like that, I rely on those torque settings more than I rely on something like Loctite or something like that. But yeah, you would have to reapply Loctite. So uh, to check the torque setting, do I 
loosen all five lug nuts and then go back and retorque them? Or can I just put the wrench on them and go click, 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 make sure it clicks about three or four times and knowing that it's good and tight? Well, remembering that if you go every time that you hit that click, you're turning. And again, I learned this from SunX, right? At, at During our tech net, every time we continue to do that click after we've hit that first one, we're tor torquing more and more down. So we're actually past our torque setting at that point. Um, so we would want to loosen them and then torque them back to the correct torque. Yeah, you know, they actually showed us a bolt that you could literally see how it was stretched as a result of over torquing. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. And thank you, everyone else. I mean, we peaked out at over, I think, over 45 people watching at one time tonight. And uh, typically we have hundreds and hundreds of people watch after the fact. So thanks, everybody, for, for chiming in. Um, thanks for commenting. Thanks for supporting Tread Lightly and BFG. And Warren is still one of our sponsors. I didn't give away a Warren prize tonight because I wanted to do that trail sack, the first one this year. But Warren will be continuing to contribute next week. Uh, next episode, we got Tim Miller going to be a guest speaker. And we're going to we're going to let Mike do his usual great work teaching us about off road stuff. But we will occasionally this season have guest speakers come in. Uh, they may do a a whole episode. Or may just do a few minutes to tell us something something important about uh, about all, what's going on in the off-roading community. That okay, Mike? Perfect. Let's tell everybody good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>